We're going to uh, start off with a number of questions that relate essentially to what happens here at Lab One. Of course, it's all about collaboration uh, and uh, uh, cross uh, segmentation. Uh, let's start with my first question, which I'll, I'll start at the end with you, Donkai. X-ray based technologies, of course, have progressed greatly in recent years with stronger tubes, higher definition, revealing even greater detail. But compared to industrial line speeds, they're still slow. How can X-ray technology be developed to become a more immediate and useful test tool in the future? It's already switched on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Very, very uh, interesting question. So I think we are all very familiar with X-ray. We have been using X-ray for process control in the uh, electronics assembly, uh, either the packaging or, or SMT and uh, other processes. And so the, it, it can be a very, very effective tool for process characterization for R&D and in the lab. And so the question has always been how can it be a more productive and effective tool for the manufacturing line? Right? And the, so fundamentally, you know, if you do x-ray, it takes time to focus and uh, set up all of that. And so fundamentally, there is, there is uh, this challenge. Right? Mm -hmm. So but while your manufacturing line is running very fast and faster and faster, so how do you resolve this uh, challenge? Uh, so the way I see it, um, one is uh, it has to be knowledge based. What, what I mean is, you know, you're not setting up an X-ray equipment. You have to understand the process, the process that you are trying to uh, 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 improve upon. That is, for example, if we are using X-ray to uh, catch voids, for example, if void is your main defect for this particular process, whether it's a flip chip or BGA, then you have to know, you know, the nature of these voids in this particular process. The size of the voids, uh, is it all the distribution of voids, you know, are they a bunch of a small voids or are they one big void? And the location of the voids, are they in the middle of the solder bump or are they near the interface? And what's the impact on reliability, on quality, right, under a particular use condition? You know, it's for drop test, for thermosec, for bending. Impact all different. So you have to, that's what I mean, you, is this has to be knowledge based. You have to understand the process. Understand the process under uh, consideration, right? Then with that knowledge, then you can focus. You know, here, this x-ray for this line, I'm not looking for everything, every void, every defect. I'm just focusing on this small voids near the interface mm. that had the greatest impact on my product reliability for this particular application. Mm. And then also I have to understand what is the frequency of my process. You know, this defect, does it, does it happen, you know, 10 ppm or 10% of the time? Mm. Then I can decide on my sampling frequency. Mm. I think with this knowledge, then you can customize your your, your, your how you apply this equipment, then you do not have to inspect every void on every sample, and that way then there is opportunity to use X-ray as a effective productive tool on the manufacturing line. Right. Yeah, no, no, you make some very good points there, uh, uh, Don Kai, but I mean, there's, there's definitely an increasing number of undetermination uh, devices like BGAs, micro BGAs, flip chips, etc. Uh, and an increasing need for uh, a, a quicker and faster way to identify the areas of concern. Um, Craig, do you have any input on this? Well, uh, first off, I'm, I'm humbled to be part of this distinguished panel. I, I, I think my only accomplishment is I made money in the manufacturing business <laughs> uh, <coughs> and survived. And I'm only 30, but the gray hair is from that. Uh, well, you know, I think we you, you touched on it earlier, and and uh, as uh, this gentleman just said, uh, data. Right? So, uh, I was shocked to learn that IBM Watson has a huge effort in the medical industry, which I think is very akin to the problems we have in manufacturing, where we have all this different equipment that produces data, 
and that data is very different. The, diff the data that comes from a solder paste inspection machine is very different than what comes from an x-ray machine. So I think a level above is the artificial intelligence of looking at the kinds of defects that are being produced in a manufacturing line and looking at those in detail with AOI and with x-ray and in addition to our manufacturing brains using artificial intelligence to try to correlate what is causing those defects, w under what circumstances do they get caused, and do they really matter? Because as is just pointed out, where the void is, is really much more important, th important than the fact that there is a void, because there will be voids. So I, I think we're going to be in manufacturing, which I call in the trenches. We're in the trenches. Uh, I think we're going to be the benefit of the explosion of big data and the merging of artificial intelligence and processing that data to come to conclusions. So I think, I don't think we're going to build faster x-ray machines to keep up with building 40 million iPhones. I think we're going to build higher level technologies that are going to take the detailed data that CT and x-ray produce and make better decisions on how to, how to set up the manufacturing lines. Right. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely going to be, as, as uh, technology improves, there's going to be faster processing uh, uh, power to be able to do that. But, um, Bill, do you think maybe AOI uh, has some uh, role to play in this to maybe help uh, focus on the areas of, of real interest on the board? Um, or what is your view on it? Uh, well, let me talk about X-ray, so okay. rather than AOI. And sure. the reason I'm doing that is... Uh, you know, first of all, I, you know, INEMI is all about collaboration. Uh, you know, we are a membership-based organization, and we thrive by enabling collaboration of the membership. Uh, one of the projects that we have now is actually in the area of automated x-ray inspection, and it's all about uh, determining the actual quality and accuracy of x-ray inspection and, it, and its ability to detect various kinds of head-on pillow and head-in pillow defects. Various kinds meaning different packages, a uh, defect that occurs on the corner versus a defect that occurs in the middle is very difficult, very different kind of problem from automated x-ray inspection machine to be able to interrogate and successfully identify. So uh, we have that study underway with a good cross-section of OEM and EMS members. Uh, Donkai's company is participating, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a good cross-section of equipment companies that have different techniques and different algorithms for processing the information, which is all about knowledge and how do you deal with it. So, uh, and we have a very sophisticated set of DOE work that's being coordinated here to really understand how do different machines thrive and how do they struggle in various scenarios. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a critical technology. You know, when I was at Intel, I think one of the keys to success in my organization was two things. One is the quality of the metrology, the tools that you use to understand how you're doing, right? Really where are your issues and where are your problems and how do you successfully move forward on them. Quality of the metro metrology and the quality of the failure analysis or the people that go with it. And x-ray and automated optical inspection are two tools and then it comes down to the quality of the people that are putting them out there in the world, developing the algorithms, developing the software, and are interacting effectively with the users in a manner that, uh, you know, they can effectively uh, provide solutions that are reliable. Right. A, good, you know, a good unit is good, a bad unit is bad, and there's no question. So right. uh, that's the challenge. There you go. So a combination of the, the people and the technology, but uh, uh, that's interesting. I'm going to move on now because we want to try and cover all of the areas that we're um, uh, involved in. Uh, so. Um, Plasma technologies have traditionally uh, been used for semiconductor deposition and etch applications. Is there a greater potential for harnessing plasma for future applications? And I'll direct that to you, Ajit. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, my first project at Bell Labs was to understand the impact of plasma on gate oxide uh, dielectric integrity. So at that time, we were saying that because we started from wet etching to dry etching with plasma. And also my graduate work uh, where we actually understood, we're trying to understand the, the chemical reactions in the plasma environment. So I think this plasma technology, plasma area is so comprehensive, so, ex so, so, so rich, that it has given so many applications 
in uh, deposition, plasma etching, uh, semiconductor has become a very dependent on plasma. But I think the new technologies which are coming out like MEMS and sensors, and I think they're gonna be definitely benefit from the plasma technology big time. So I think this is really have a huge potential going forward. And uh, also the, the other thing which is uh, probably used somewhat, the lot of uh, big machineries for cleaning them, you know, the plasma becomes a very good tool for cleaning. You can have a portable plasma torch and clean the, 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 the air, aircraft engine with the plasma mm -hmm. and without damaging the, the other accessories around it. Right. So I think there's so many new applications. I, I think this is uh, plasma technology is here to stay for many more years. But also, the, again, the, I think uh, what Bill mentioned, the word collaboration, and probably any question you ask me, I'll bring the collaboration word in, in between because there's so much to learn unless we collaborate and share the information with each other. We're not gonna solve the problems or not make time to solution faster. Right. So I think the key to the, your first question on X-ray also is collaborate and share you know, with people what you have learned. Now you don't need to share the, 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 the personal information of the company or the business, but the knowledge you should share which will only help to solve the problem faster and you learn from each other. It's share means you get something from each other, you know, it's not just giving it away. So plasma, again, uh, is a, my personal experience, expertise in plasma for many years and uh, I think this is really a long ways to go yet. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, Bill, a uh, question to you, uh, I mean, on, on um, uh, plasma, I mean, what, what other benefits uh, are you gonna get using plasma systems? Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of with Ajit. I think that the opportunity... Can you hold the microphone? The opportunities in the uh, application... Is that better? Mm -hmm. Oppor opportunities in the applications in, in this space are, are significant, and they're more than we understand at this point. And, you know, I was talking to one of the employees of uh, Comment Group and uh, Lab One, and, you know, the question is, how do you take these technology... You're one of your questions you're going to get to mm -hmm. is, how do you combine the assets of plasma and e-beam and x-ray? to solve real problems and you know I don't know the answer to that but the challenge I think to the to your group is to bring together a subsection of experts in an environment where they can share their ideas on the critical problems and the critical opportunities they see and you can facilitate it in a manner where you can boil down all that information into a, cute, a few key nuggets that that are opportunities that are unique that collaboration, you know, bringing together a, a cross-section of supply chain players and users uh, is beneficial to solving those problems. So, uh, you know, I would encourage you guys to look at bringing together small groups. You know, this is 20 to 40 people. You get bigger than that, it's hard to manage it effectively. 20 to 40 people that are open-minded and are willing to participate in uh, share their ideas about where the new technology opportunities are in the field of plasma, in the field of e-beam, in the field of whatever. Right. Okay, okay. I mean, touching on the, the, the collaboration thing that you mentioned yeah. and also Ajit mentioned, um, uh, Craig, I mean, one of the things do you think that's driving the need for collaboration is also the speed of development. I mean, products have been introduced to market much faster these days, uh, faster than companies' abilities to really keep up with it. So collaboration, <laughs> is another way to pull on other resources that, that would take you too long to get in place. Yeah, yeah, two things, two responses to that, Trevor. You know, first on, on uh, the last first, but to expand on Bill's point, uh, I learned today that everything I thought I knew about eBeam mm -hmm. was one little part of what eBeam can do and what's possible. And all the areas, you know, the, the food safety and, and uh, the energy efficiency and the energy savings using e-beam to do things that are traditionally done by much more energy consuming technologies. I didn't know any of that. Uh, I knew that e-beam has applications in, in IC tools and maybe part of the enabling technologies that gets us down to single digit uh, nanometers. Uh, but I had no idea that there's a good chance some of the food I eat has been, has been you know, made more safe through e-beams. And so the, the collaboration you know, part of the lab here is to expose people that the technology of an e-beam lamp can be used to do an enormously wide range of things, and the company who's created it doesn't necessarily know what those are. 
but the lab is here to experiment. Bring it on, bring on the problem, we'll figure it out. Um, what was the first part of your question? What was the, the well, we were talking about? Well, we talked about collaboration, um, and I, I think that was that was really it. The fact that that um, you know products are coming to market so oh, much faster. Oh, the speed! Yes, yeah, thank you. So, one of my favorite stories is being involved in a project uh, about eleven months ago, where the engineer came and said, "I need this board laid out." Uh, the bill of materials wasn't done; they were on a very tight schedule. Two months after that, uh, prototypes were being built, and I am not exaggerating, six months from, seven months from the first meeting, I was wandering, I'm kind of a geek at heart, as you know, so <clears throat> I make stealth trips over to Fry's Electronics, uh, and I was wandering through Fry's Electronics, and darn if I did not see the products that we prototyped six months before. The, I describe the pace here as beyond frenetic. And it's not always fun. It's definitely not always profitable for those of us in the trenches who have to build this stuff and, 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 and operate at that speed. And it's not always comfortable from the pe perspective of that we're creating things before the engineers would, well, let's do some more testing and some more simulation. And the marketing guys are saying, like, if we don't get it out there, the competitor will. Well, that's the world we live here in Silicon Valley. It's chaotic. Sometimes it's messy. Uh, sometimes it doesn't operate as process driven as we would like it to well that's too bad that's the world and and so that you know the only way you can really survive in that no one company no matter how big and i think you're seeing that no one company can slay that right that's a collaboration and it, it has to be done that's the only way we're going to continue to advance I mean, Donkai, you work for one of the biggest companies in our industry, and I'm sure you must run into this all the time, you know, the, 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 the demands of the market, the, the speed to get product to market. But, I mean, going back to our original uh, topic, we talked about um, uh, using uh, uh, semiconductor plasma uh, uh, deposition. Uh, what sort of um, benefits do you see uh, using, using plasma? Um, plasma, of course, I think used more widely uh, on the front end, the fab side, than on the back end assembly side. But still, for packaging, for example, uh, surface cleaning for s packaging processes using plasma is very, very common. And I think moving forward, perhaps uh, plasma can be used to form uh, uh, conductive patterns on various surfaces. Because when we go to, you know, f where it's a wearable, or flexible circuit, non-traditional uh, conductive uh, 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 patterns, circuitry, um, I think plasma can be used to help form some of the conductive structures on, on, on various surfaces because it's, it's a surface uh, interaction tool, right? And that's probably some of the potential areas, yeah. right? Uh, but then coming back to the collaboration the speed, I think you know collaboration really is a enabler to speed. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you get fast? Well, you, you, you have knowledge. How do you get knowledge? You have a group learning. And so I think this setting, a setting like this, and uh, also not only with the hardware, but maybe also build a community, a user community, mm -hmm. uh, can be a, a big accelerator to that learning process. And also, it's uh, the cross-pollinization across industries mm -hmm. uh, can be very, very powerful to accelerate the learning within the user community. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree, and I, and I do think it's it's Comet's aim once we uh, get beyond today, uh, you know, to have a lot of uh, user group meetings and, and engage companies like or, or associations like SEMI and INEMI. Uh, to do uh, activities here. Another um, surface preparation technology is E-beam. It's used for lithography and metrology. It's also used for sterilization, uh, surface preparation, cross-linking, and curing. It enables low temperature processing for thin film, uh, surface engineering, and semiconductor applications, and it can be integrated with other processes and equipment. What other industries could this type of technology uh, be used for? Any ideas? Well, Trevor, uh, I heard the best analogy uh, for one of the things that e-beam technology can do that my simple mind could wrap around. 
such a complex topic, which is picture a box of Legos of various colors, various sizes, and those are, those are atomic and molecular structures. And somebody walks in with that box and dumps it on the floor in front of a bench of energized kids uh, who are eager to build something. They have no idea what they're going to build. So what eBeam gives them the ability to do is basically use mechanical engineering principles to do chemistry, to basically rearrange things at the atomic and molecular level. So I had no idea. I had no idea that eBeam is used to sterilize packaging, to, to absolutely interrupt the growth of, of bad bugs, you know, things that can hurt people in the food chain. We're going to have something like 9 billion people on the planet in 2050. And the electricity, the energy required to move the food, most of the food is grown in places which are not where it's consumed. So just moving the food and keeping it safe and keeping bad things from growing in the food is a huge application of e-beam that you wouldn't imagine. And there are other ways of doing that today, but those ways are in most cases an order of magnitude more energy inefficient, mm -hmm. right? So the, the, the really when you can when you can tell an engineering and, and look at what we have here in Silicon Valley when you can tell an entire valley I can help you rearrange things on a molecular level. What would you like to do with it? Well, pretty much anything that's possible you can do with it. So I think there we are absolutely in the in the lead. And here's the lab. The equipment is right here. The experts are right here. The box of Legos is right here. Let's dump it out and see what we can do. I don't think we know ourselves what we can do, right. but we've got the tools. Yeah. No, I, th I think, well, it's, it's, it's not an area that I was familiar with before I, I came here. Um, Bill, are, uh, are you familiar with the E-Beam technology? Uh, not a great deal. Not a great no, deal. No, okay. I know a lot, of, a lot about a lot of things and a little about that thing. So <laughs> that's not one of my areas of expertise. Don't okay. what What's your view on it? I mean, e -beam, eh, I, I don't know that much uh, about e -beam, but e -beam, it's a source of energy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, generally, you know, of course, it can be used to modify material properties, especially mm -hmm. polymeric materials, stabilize materials, yeah. stabilize the mechanical property, chemical property, other properties of polymeric materials, mm -hmm. and can be used to modify surfaces because you can melt and recrystallize surfaces, and that's a surface modification used very widely. And can be used for joining, of course, because you know that's an energy source. You can use to join uh, dissimilar metals. Mm -hmm. And also, very interestingly, uh, E-beam can be used to deconstruct mm -hmm. for recycling, because re in recycling, you often run into a mixture of many different materials. And how do you separate them? And E-beam can be a very useful tool to separate uh, composite materials, hmm. uh, 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 separate uh, some the high temperature, some very toxic uh, materials from the rest of the, the, the body material. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for recycling, uh, E-beam can, can be a very, very powerful tool. Right. Uh, so not only for building, but for uh, deconstruction as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very interesting technology with lots of different um, uh, applications, and I think we're just at, at the beginning with that. Yeah, we, t we talked about the, uh, the blue laser. The blue is the new green, right? So right. we can do things that you can do tr with the traditional technologies with less energy and, and do it faster, it basically in every variable better. Mm -hmm. and, and so the places that can apply to are, are just mind-boggling. Right. Just one comment on uh, E-Beam. Mm. Uh, probably people are forgetting that uh, E-beam has been in existence for many, many years. Uh, the photo mask for the semiconductor technology mm -hmm. were made only by E-beam. And then today also, we still make by E-beams. E Those machines cost double-digit million dollars. Mm -hmm. And we used to do the next generation photo lith with E-beam. In Bell Labs, we could afford that. Mm -hmm. We used to use E-beam to do if the industry is working on, uh, say, uh, 0.75 micron, we'll print the circuits of 0.5 micron or even smaller with e-beam. That with e-beam you could do that. As uh, you said, there's a source of energy, and you, the way you program it and tune it, you can print uh, all kind of circuits. And even today, 
if EUV doesn't work, e beam will work, but it's very expensive. Right. But one thing which I was inspired, and I think uh, Craig is a, is a geek, and he probably has a lot more inspiration than me, <laughs> that with all the technologies that application that e beam is, is doing, is really fascinating. But the most fascinating thing was the tool which is sitting right there. I asked the question, how much it cost? And the, the Paul Smith told me about $400,000 or less than half a million dollar. I was blown away with that. Mm. I think whatever improvements and technology enhancements have happened, this has made EBM much more practical, usable for new applications. And again, going back to the, the comment that uh, uh, Bill is making, uh, with collaboration, with sharing, we can really develop a lot more applications. And this is the place where the tools are here. You, people don't need to buy new tools and right. come work, but collaborate and share with the, and create a community here for Absolutely. eBeam application. I think this, yeah. this, this could be very, very, very valuable and helpful for the industry to grow. Yeah, I totally agree. It's a very versatile tool, and I think, uh, as I say, we're, we're, we're s still discovering lots of different applications. Okay, gentlemen, we're running out of time, so I'm going to move on to our last question. Um, and, of course, Lab One has been open to provide uh, state-of-the-art inspection, RF plasma technology development, and electron beam technologies, as we've discussed. One of the key themes is to encourage and develop applications by cross-segment pollination uh, of some of these technologies. How should users make full use of these facilities and services in the future? And I'll start at the end there with, with Donkai. Oh, um, so, so, so uh, first of all, I, I want to congratulate uh, Comet for uh, setting up this, uh, uh, this very spacious and the very uh, advanced uh, facility here. Uh, I think this is a very, uh, going to be a very useful facility for the user community in, in this area. Um, mainly, you know, I see this one of course service to help, especially the startups, yeah. companies that cannot afford to have this in-house equipment, and the availability of this facility uh, would be a big help to those companies. Yeah. Right? Uh, number two, as we discussed, this can create a community for collaboration, sharing, learning, uh, cross-pollination, mm -hmm. and for even, even to generate more knowledge, more solution, more technical solutions for the industry overall, mm -hmm. uh, go beyond each individual user or company. Yeah. Uh, and some of that can probably lead to you know, standard and best practices, uh, going into uh, SAMI and uh, NME. And um, uh, so in that regard, I think there's a very uh, good facility uh, with a lot of potential for uh, community learning and the growth together. And it's uh, good for the industry. Yeah, no, I think it's a very well put. Craig. Yeah, I mean, absolutely echo uh, what was just said. Um, you know, we all face competitive pressures in businesses and we don't want to share our secret secret sauce. So we're not here to explain exactly how we make the x-ray or CT machines do the magic that they do and share the code. What we're here to do is these are tools. Right. The e-beam is tools. The lamps that we create are tools. The CT machines are tools. The plasma chambers are tools. So what do you do with those tools? You invite people to come and look at them, to play with them, to experiment. So this, this theme of collaboration over and over and over again, and as you know, in factories I've run, we've had tons of tours, people coming through, and I knew we had competitors coming through. Uh, I don't think there's anything we're going to show them that's gonna teach them about contract manufacturing that hasn't been known for the last 30 years, right? We just do it faster or, or add some software. So the, the thing is creating a place where people can come and then the next step is get the people to come. So there, you know, all the events that are planned throughout the next 12 months and beyond where small groups of people will be invited in from all the universities that are here in Silicon Valley. The investment community, right. the investment community, the manufacturing community, the user community to say, well, while you're here looking at that CT machine, check out that thing over there, mm. right? That, they may not have, a, have, have an application today, but at the rate people change jobs, at the rate technology changes, at the rate new things happen, it will stick in their mind. I remember being there and talking to 
this gentleman or the gentleman to my right or one of the people in the audience or some young engineer with that machine, that's what's going to have to happen. And right. I think all companies, I don't think, I think Common is, is providing leadership here to do that, but I think all companies have to start doing that. And, and I think you're seeing that happen. Bill. Uh, so your question is, how should they make full use of yeah, the facilities? Yeah, how should they make there? full use of it? I mean. Yeah, I think, you know, not to repeat what uh, Don Kai and Craig have said. So I think, you know, uh, the power of collaboration is, is really bringing together a cross-section of expertise that work together on a, on to solve a problem. You know, we're all good at, everybody in this room is really good at something. Nobody in this room is good at everything. So the trick is to, to bring together the critical material experts and the critical tool and equipment experts with those people that have a good feel for applications and markets, you know, whether it's medical or, or agricultural or automotive or whatever it might be. And, um, and bring them into this facility and, and let them go to work together, uh, bringing their expertise to the, to the table. And, uh, you know, they can, they can therefore do holistic problem solving, not point uh, solutions that are not terribly far reaching. Right. Okay. Um, Ajit, final word to you. Um, uh, with the heavy data driven society that we're moving into, uh, it seems that everything's becoming, you know, uh, more process driven uh, and centers like this are becoming uh, more important. We're seeing it in other areas of the industry uh, where, they're, where they're bringing uh, pick and place equipment into work with printers and different areas like that. Um, is this type of uh, facility uh, an important uh, step uh, in the future towards uh, collaboration? You know, uh, Travis, say collaboration, I can write a book. Because that has been my DNA from the time I started my career in Bell Labs and throughout my career in Philips, we had a, I mean, we were competitors, Freescales, ST, and Philips. We had a collaboration of uh, technology development in, in Kroll, France. And uh, again, we kept these secrets to ourselves, but we worked on things which were pre competitive together and save cost. And the same thing, uh, uh, and the other thing of my journey, I've given many, many keynote speeches. And this is a public domain. I've been talking about collaboration from, for many years. Now, how you put collaboration into practice and what it, the value it brings. And I think uh, uh, Bill said it right, you know, to get the right communities together. So that not everybody knows everything. How do you bring the people together to share what you know and what you're expert or what's your core competency? And in simple way, I will say, one plus one, if you have two, you can only pass the classroom exam. But if one plus one is two in corporate world or the boardroom, you will fail, you will be not successful. So one plus one has to be at least more than three, if not 11. <coughs> so that in my experience is that collaboration has given me the, the math uh, equation solving from one plus one to more than 11. So I think that's the value of collaboration. And uh, I can give you a lot more tangible examples how I come to this number. And I think this this facility offers that kind of advantage to the industry. INAMI, I'm sure the same thing. Flex is actually doing that. They, of course, they are doing with a lot of customers and they have a uh, Chinese wall around uh, each experiment. But I'm sure there is some knowledge being shared mm. and this one plus one is more than two for sure. Right. And in SEMI, we are very open book and we uh, we we promote a lot of collaboration my focus on this role is to make sure that one plus one is more than 11. Well, gentlemen, you know, some, some wonderful examples of, of collaboration on how we should innovate, implement, and accelerate. Um, uh, I think we're running out of time here, unfortunately, because people do need to, uh, uh, are waiting for the, the food and uh, also to, <laughs> to have a, a mingle around. Uh, I'm going to, at this point, uh, say thank you to our panelists, Don Kai Shangwan from Plex, Craig Akuri, uh, Bill Beda from INEMI and Ajit Minoka from SEMI organization. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.